Welcome to Machine Learning. This is the Spring 2024 edition. Um, if you're a grad student, you are in CS 6350. If you are an undergrad in CS, you are in uh, 5350. If you're a data science major, you are in 4340. If none of these numbers seem familiar to you, you can feel free to walk and I will not say anything. Or you can just hang out and you know we can go through machine learning. Um, so we, let's get started. Uh, this class is also being streamed uh, on Zoom. So we have a bunch of people on Zoom as well. So every now and then I'll be looking at my screen to see if you have, if, if there are any questions. Folks on Zoom, if you have questions, feel free to use the chat. All right, let's get started. Um, I don't like starting the first lecture of the semester with logistics because uh, that's boring. And uh, I know that you've seen the syllabus and the policies and all those things many, many times. Not necessarily for this class, but you know what I'm talking about. So rather than talking about anything uh, uh, boring starting off, I'll come to that later. Uh, I want to talk about something slightly technical, which is what is machine learning? So we are here to uh, um, learn about machine learning. So it seems like a reasonable question to get out of the way in the first lecture so that we can deal with the technical details later. The goal of this lecture today, and actually for the entire semester, is to answer the question, what's learning? And in particular, what's machine learning? So let's uh, start this off. Let's play a game. There are about 180 of you in this room. Um, there are a few chairs here if you want. Um, so we can't play any real game, so let's kind of play a game and I'll ask you questions, you can shout out the answer. So this is called the Badges Game. Uh, every year, there's a conference. There are a few conferences on machine learning, on AI, on NLP, and such uh, topics. One of, the, uh, one of the premier conferences in machine learning is called the International Conference on Machine Learning. Um, and this has been happening for several decades now. And um, if, if you've been to a conference, the first thing they do is when you register, uh, they give you a badge with your name on it. So that's what happened here. Um, everyone who attended the conference got a name tag with their name on it. But that's not all there was. There was a plus or a minus on the, on the badge. And uh, only one person knew how the plus or the minus was assigned to the badge. And that was Hank Birch, who was the organizer. And the only guarantee that he was willing to make is um, that sign, the plus or the minus, depends on nothing but your name. So this was, in some sense, a challenge for all the people who attended the conference on machine learning. Look at as many examples as you can. Try to figure out that hidden function that I use to generate the plus or minus, because you all claim to be experts on machine learning. Let's see if you can learn that function. That was the goal of that game. Um, so that data set, uh, after the conference was over, the data was uh, available. and. Uh, I took the data set, but uh, I changed it a little. But the kinds of functions that might be, you know, some, if the second letter of the first name uh, is a vowel, then it's a plus, otherwise it's a minus. It turns out that was the function that was actually used in the conference. But uh, we're not going to use that. It could be something else. The first name is longer than the last name. The number of characters in the first name is more than the number of characters in the last name. It's a plus, otherwise it's a minus. And so on. You can imagine there are many such functions, right? So let's play the game. Imagine that you get, uh, the, the idea is that you know, attendees walk around in the conference, you talk to each other, and then look at the, you know, we're talking about machine learning conferences. People are shy, they don't like looking at each other in the face. So you look at the name tag and they're like, oh, what's a, it's a plus. So we run into Claire Cardi, who is now at Cornell. Um, we see that her name has a plus. Peter Bartlett at Berkeley has a minus. Can anyone guess what the function was? Yes. Um, male names have a minus, female names have a plus. Uh, that is a function, yes. Any other function, yes. Uh, the first and last names that we can remember. Nice, okay. So by, okay, that's, let's do one more. Yeah. Uh, the number of letters in the first name and the last name are the same, so it's a plus. I think you're right. I mean, I'm, yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, so the point is, how do you know which of these functions is the one that I used? So I, I just label these things using uh, a made-up function of mine. 
Do you have any reason to believe one of these is better than the other? What you might ask is like, you just, you've just given me two names. Let's see a few more. So let's say you walk around in the conference a bit more and you see a few more. By the way, if you, for any of those functions that you had, you answer the question of how the labels are generated. Now, once you have those uh, rules, you can label any name, right? If the first and the last name have the same number of letters, then it's a plus, so Indiana Jones gets a minus. So any of those functions allows you to label any name, even the names that don't exist in nature. Okay, let's walk around. Let's see more names. Uh, you have <coughs> run into four more. Um, are those of you who had the answers willing to revise your hypotheses and or come up with new ones? By the way, am I audible at the back? All the way at the back? Okay. Yes. New function? Yeah. Uh, the first letter of the first name is uh, the, I mean, the alpha order is uh, less or equal to E is plus and greater than E will be minus. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that works. I... Um, it works, yes. It, 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 technically, that's uh, it works here. So the answer was if the first letter or the first name comes before or before e or e equal to e, then it's a plus. Otherwise, it's a minus. Um, and otherwise, uh, yeah. Any other? Yeah. If the sort of character of the name is a minimum, it's a plus, and it's an all. It's an it's an all. It's a minus. I am not going to do the counting, <laughs> but maybe you're right. See, the point is this. There is, while you can come up with many, many rules to label these names, you have no reason to believe that that was the rule that I had in my head when I came up with whatever I did. I'll give you one more piece of information. Um, the rule that I came up with roughly created an equal number of pluses or minuses. Um, it, it's, I, I mean, I don't know if that helps or not, but that's what it was. I'm not going to tell you what the function is. Um, the full data is on the class website. You can uh, go home, take a look at the, the I think, 200-ish names that are there and try to come up with a guess. Um, this is, uh, so in some sense, the game that we are playing with machine learning. There is a hidden function somewhere. That function might not be silly like labeling names. It might be things like, deciding whether an email is spam or not. There is some function, nature has some function, and our goal is to use computational means to solve that puzzle, namely discover that function. The problem is never that we can't find the function. We can always find a function. Problem is, how do we know it's the right one? How can we tell that we got the right function that is in the mind of nature? So what's machine learning? Rather than answer what's machine learning, let me ask you, have you encountered machine learning? As in the form of uh, uh, users or in the form of, uh, you know, proper, have you implemented it? Have you, have you been subject to machine learning? Let me ask you that. Have you, has, has your life ever outside of academic uh, situations, have you encountered machine learning where it has done something in your life? Yes. Machine learning is used in translation software. Yes. So if you ever use any translation software, you've used machine learning. In fact, I would argue that uh, it's un unlikely that you have not been, um, uh, you've not used machine learning. If you've ever used Amazon or if you've ever bought anything online, um, People have bought something online, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so if you've ever bought anything online, chances are that you get some recommendations. If you like this, then you might like that. There's a machine learning system that's uh, running that. Uh, translation, as you pointed out. Uh, perhaps the most ubiquitous use of machine learning that all of us are subject to without actually even sometimes thinking about it is spam detectors. Um, your email spam 
inbox is probably full of garbage. And for the most part, you never see it because there's some rather simple machine learning system actually that uh, is filtering out emails. Uh, but you can do more complicated things. You have all these uh, um, uh, automated assistants like ChatGPT, which is like a extremely complicated version of the same kinds of things that we'll talk about. We'll not talk about ChatGPT in this class, but uh, extremely, you can. It is a product of machine learning or your uh, voice assistants on your devices that I'm not going to name because then it will start asking me if I need something or most of your phones will wake up. <laughs> um, or uh, self-driving cars, such as they are, can only work because the sensor data in the car is continually processed by machine learning systems. You are probably impacted by it in more ways than you uh, immediately realize. I talked about spam detection. Most of the times when we uh, use any photo sharing software, you get these little boxes around people. How do you know which set of pixels is a person and which set of pixels is not a person? Well, it's machine learning that's uh, helping you out there. You can search through your photo collection just by naming things. You can say, oh, I want to find uh, all photos of uh, uh, downtown Salt Lake City. You may not have tagged your photo with downtown Salt Lake City, but something analyzes the photo and automatically assigns those tags. That something is the machine learning system. Um, you can, you know, Netflix has built a entire kingdom, uh, not just Netflix, but um, as an example of recommending movies to people. Um, there's a Amazon and other such organizations recommend products to people. These are all product uh, uh, use cases of machine learning. Uh, uh, speaking of uh, a lot of money, there's a quite a bit of machine learning in. Uh, there's a message. Okay, there's quite a bit of machine learning in spam detection and uh, in, in sorry in uh, stock price prediction in pricing um, uh, things that people price. Um, you know, a simple example uh, of a binary decision. There's a certain stock, let's say Apple. Given all the everything I know about the economy and Apple and the news and Twitter and everything or whatever that service is called today. Um, will the stock price go up or will it go down? It's a binary decision, yes or no. Uh, handwriting recognition is so robust that the USPS uses machine learning systems to sort through millions of mail pieces every year, maybe even more than, maybe a few orders of magnitude more. Um, you can, uh, th there are billions of dollars that have been generated simply because of machine learning systems because they, among other things, they decide in uh, uh, they help in deciding what ads show up on your website, on uh, YouTube, and on whatever. Any the choice of your ad, the ads to show up is a decision from a machine learning system. Translation: You can read, uh, you can now quote unquote read uh, documents that were written in a language that you don't know because you can just give it to a translation system, and they are so good that you almost um, you can probably make sense of uh, it for the most part. Uh, but there are cooler applications that are more, not just directly customer facing. Machine learning uh, technology has been used for, say, uh, sorting through genetic uh, data to find markers for conditions like Alzheimer's disease. Um, or uh, one of the uh, one of the big advances of science of the 21st century, according to the journal Science, is uh, a, a, a system called AlphaFold from DeepMind, which can fold proteins, which can predict the 3D structure of proteins. And it's just so good that it's better, it's as good as people. And uh, uh, this, this has been called like one of the biggest advances in science of this century. Um, another, uh, Cool example is uh, some work actually that happens here at the U. Um, imagine that I'm able to specify some uh, material, some properties of materials. Uh, I need something that can survive brilliantly from space, and I need to build it using only materials that are found in Utah and the neighboring states. You give a description, and it creates, pro it proposes materials for you. Um, and uh, this is like, you know, the, 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 I can keep going. This is exciting. Uh, <laughs> For the most part, in this class, we won't be talking about those applications. My hope is that you'll be, you'll have enough of a background out of this class 
to go into specialized classes that talk to you, that tell you about this, these things. Machine learning is everywhere, but notice how I did not really answer the question. I didn't tell you what machine learning is. So let's talk about what learning is. Let's try to define learning um, of the machine kind, of the human kind. Um, let's focus more on the machines, but uh, let's uh, uh, dive in a bit. Um, one of the first, before, rather than me telling you, can people tell me what learning is? What does it mean to learn? Yes. Taking in new, taking in information from past experiences or past results, and trying to infer some kind of meaning or understanding from that. So the answer was taking information from past experience and trying to infer meaning out of that. Uh, that's a reasonable answer. There's one technical thing that's missing from that, and we'll get into that. Um, other, any other answers? What is learning? You are in an institution of learning. Yes. So here's how a very complex nonlinear function that adapts to all the previous data and make it to predict the future data. So the answer was, we build a complex nonlinear function that can adapt to all previous data and make it predict on future data. Um, my one complaint about that is it doesn't have to be a nonlinear function. It doesn't have to be complex. In fact, I would argue that simplicity is a virtue, uh, but uh, you're getting to the, the more interesting point, namely making predictions about the future. And that's an interesting point. So let's see what uh, people have talked about uh, learning in the literature. Perhaps the first, to my knowledge, the first time an academic paper had the phrase machine learning in it was this paper from 1959, Some Studies in Machine Learning Using the Game of Checkers by Arthur Sanderson. Um, it's a really fun paper. If you can find it, I would recommend reading it. It was written in 1959. Um, just to kind of remind, give you put some context here, 1959 is before we had transistors, before computers looked anything like they do today. Um, so it, 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 it's a different world. And uh, in that paper, uh, he talks about how programming computers to learn from experience will eliminate the need for us to be writing programs. Because if the program, if the computer can learn from experience, then we don't have to be programming the computer. And uh, once again, I want to highlight the point that this was done before most programming languages we know today existed. Before computers we know as today as we know today existed. And he was, this is like way ahead of his time. And uh, uh, he had a prediction in that at the end of the paper, as a result of these experiments where he showed that it can play checkers, uh, we can say with some certainty that uh, there might be some economically feasible applications of this idea of machine learning. Um, I think he was right. So uh, one of the cool things he does talk about also is this difference between memorization or rote learning and generalization. He hints about it, he doesn't talk about it in great detail, but in terms of that difference is the biggest thing that we have. The difference between just memorizing something and generalizing. Generalizing requires uh, making predictions about the future. Learning is generalization. Uh, the other, uh, in another interesting, uh, uh, not definition, but description of machine learning uh, comes from Herbert Feynman. Robert Simon, if you've not heard of the name, is the only person, the only member of our species to have ever won both a Turing Award and a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. um, smart guy. Yeah. Um, so he uh, talked about, he, he, he described learning as changes in systems that are adaptive in the sense that they enable the system to do a task from the same population better the next time it has to do that task. Now, the task is not specified. It could be any task. It could be predicting whether an email is spam or uh, not, or it could be fully automatic uh, driving from here to California. Uh, there's a nice quote in this paper, old programs don't learn, they simply fade away. And any of you who try to run some code that you wrote, say, two years ago mm -hmm. on a new computer might recognize that old programs don't just fade away, they give you grief before fading away. <laughs> so, Learning is generalization. It's not enough to be able to just do a task well. It's important that the program has to adapt so that it does it better the next time it does the task. Uh, by the way, everything here is uh, 
uh, I talk about machine learning, but it's also about human learning, about the kind of learning that we do. Um, in his textbook, uh, Tom Mitchell, who's at TMU, uh, defined learning a little bit more, uh, gave a slightly more well posed definition of machine learning. A computer program is said to learn from some experience. Let's call that experience E. With respect to a class of tasks, let's call those tasks T, and a performance measure P is the performance in the task in T as measured according to the previously well-defined stated performance measure P improves as experience grows. As the program encounters more and more experience, whatever that means, according to some previously uh, agreed upon measures of performance, this program starts doing better. Experience could take many different forms. Experience could involve uh, a data set. It could involve a collection of, like, like the table that I showed you. As you see more rows of that data, of the table, you get more experience. Or experience could involve interacting with the world. Experience could involve a car learning to drive itself by driving around on the road and making mistakes. Uh, that's a terrible idea. But you know that could also be experience. And performance measure is also defined for the class of tasks that we have at hand. You can't ask a self-driving car to, uh, for instance, uh, decide whether an email is spam or not, because that makes no sense. You can't ask your spam detector to drive a car. That makes even less sense. So you have to have like performance measures that are designed for the task. So a uh, spam detector email, uh, uh, performance measure might be how many spam emails were let through, what fraction of the emails were uh, misclassified as spam, for example. Uh, you can think of uh, performance measures for a self-driving car. Some of them can be rather, uh, uh, shall, we, shall we say, gory, and some of them can be rather uh, meaningful, like did the car get to its destination without hitting things. In any way, the key point here is improvement in performance. Learning is generalizing. Learning is generalizing because the goal is not to do well on the data that has already been seen, on the exact experience, on the previously seen instances, but the goal is to do better on future instances, on instances that have never been seen. Now, this is actually a very subtle point, but it's a big distinction between traditional perspectives of statistics and machine learning. In statistics, we want to describe data. In machine learning, we want to make predictions and we want to generalize to new things. Let me give you an example. Imagine that you have to train a program that looks at a photograph and decides whether there's a dog in that picture or not. So maybe there are these nine dogs that your program is trained on, and it decides that these are all dogs. They say it's, it gets really good at it. I don't care how well your program does on these nine programs, mean these nine dogs, it needs to generalize to the next picture. And the next picture could be, could look nothing like these nine. It could be something like that. And I'm sure most of us agree that's a dog. Right? So how do, how do you know? How did, did you train? Did you spend some time training yourself to detect dogs and such things? No, I hope not. Uh, uh, and probably there's a reasonable chance you've actually not seen that picture before. So we want programs that can generalize in the same way. We want programs that can see instances gain experience that uh, that is available and then generalize to completely new kinds of instances. By the way, feel free to ask questions. Feel free to, uh, uh, you know, uh, drop in. Yeah. So uh, as Robert Simon said, he, he mentions about the changes, right? Yes. Uh, and we understand by the end of his definition and the next one, the next person after that, the change of means improvements basically yeah. and then we talk about statistics and machine mm -hmm. generalization and machine learning yeah. so how different generalization is as compared to let's say extrapolation i don't know what extrapolation is like uh, uh, i have a very formal definition of generalization in my head and you will too at the end of the semester i don't know what extrapolation is so uh, it's basically again um having a set of uh points uh depending on an experience and then Deriving a future prediction can be sense. I I I am not a statistics student, but I have a very generalized uh, sense of 
sense of what extrapolation is. So, the, the, oh, I see. So extrapolation might involve making predictions on points that are outside the range of things that are there. Um, yeah, so the, the, that, yes, the in the simple cases that makes sense and it seems like it's the same thing. But uh, when we talk about these sorts of images, the idea of extrapolation seems like it doesn't quite fit because these images you know, don't lie on a vector space. I mean, they do in a certain sense, but they don't naturally lie on a vector space. So the mathematical notion of extrapolation might not directly transfer. It may, but not, it, it, you, I don't want to go into the math yet, uh, but it may transfer, but not quite there. So I used to say in earlier instances of this class that machine learning is the future. I'm correcting that. Machine learning is here. It's the present. Um, it gives systems the ability to perform a task um, in situations that have never been encountered before. And that is a desirable property we have for any computer systems because chances are uh, we want our programs to work on data that have not that has not been seen before. We, we I mean, imagine that you want to train a program that can uh, uh, drive uh, a Mars rover. You want it to train on Earth and then drive on Mars. You don't. You, there's no point in. You, you see where I'm going, right? You want to build programs that are robust to uh, these sorts of changes in the in kinds of inputs that it can handle. And for me personally, this is a new way to think about programs. Traditionally, when we think about programming, we think about writing instructions that we uh, use to kind of tell the computer. Uh, what to do. So uh, basically, we, the pro a program is a set of instructions that we want the computer to follow. The machine learning perspective is there are some cases where that makes perfect sense. Like if you want to sort a list of numbers, don't use machine learning, just use a, well, some sorting algorithm that you know. But if you want to detect a cat in a picture, you're going to, you can try to write a program for that, but it's going to be really hard. Instead, you write a different program. You write a program that learns how to write programs. Or you write a program that can train new programs. So rather than writing the cat detector, you write a learning algorithm that figures out how to write that program that can detect cats. So it's a new way to think about programming because uh, it allows us to build programs that can acquire new capabilities that you, as the programmer, did not give it. And this is a very exciting thing. Um, so the, the, one of the, the obvious use cases here is the ability to handle uh, inputs that have never been encountered before allows us to write programs that can handle, that can work with messy data sets, that can work with noisy inputs. So this is why machine learning is a big driver in data science. You're of course already using machine learning based applications either directly or indirectly. Um, as a field, machine learning is a very active area of research. It's a very active area of exploration. And uh, it's also very closely connected to many other fields. So how many people here have taken a class on artificial intelligence? Some subset of it. Artificial intelligence is about uh, making computers that are as intelligent as humans. Uh, that's a very uh, loose summary of a very broad field. But machine learning essentially drives artificial intelligence, uh, um, at least the way it is done today. Uh, there are strong connections to theoretical computer science and mathematics um, because of the attempt to formalize the concept of learning. It allowed us to talk about uh, um, guarantees of what cannot be learned. For example, something that cannot be learned is uh, uh, the state of a random number generator because it's truly random. So uh, that, that's just a trivial example. And there are certain computational limitations on what can and cannot be learned. Uh, the mathematical treatment of machine learning builds heavily on uh, fields like probability and statistics, on linear algebra, on the theory of computation and mathematical optimization. All of these fields in some sense come together in a nice package in machine learning. Now, each of these, of course, is a four-year degree program of its own. And uh, I don't think it made sense to have those four degrees as prerequisites for this class. So 
I'm going to uh, hope that we'll kind of touch upon some of these topics as we go along. They are clearly connected to philosophy and cognitive science and such things because we're talking about something that is innately human until these kinds of programs came along. The concept of learning is such a human thing. Um, Leslie Valiant, who uh, uh, defined one of the theories of uh, one of the dominant theories of machine learning, and he got a Turing Award for that. Uh, in some sense, his um, big contribution was to recognize that the idea of learning, which is this loose and vague idea that is hard to formalize, can actually be formalized mathematically, and we can actually say meaningful, non-trivial statements about what can and cannot be learned. Um, there are connections to linguistics, there are connections to neuroscience and such things, and of course, there are uh, innumerable applications um, across computer science, across medicine, engineering, uh, mental health, psychology, health broadly, a um, lot of money to be made, and such things. And all of this is, you know, together often seen as machine learning. Um, one of the things that I get very excited about with this class is these different perspectives typically get reflected in the class, in the composition of the class. I was looking at the um, the composition of the class before, and you know, we have students from all sorts of backgrounds, uh, academic backgrounds, which is really cool. And uh, all of these backgrounds contribute into this and can build on top of this. Any questions? Yes. So the question was, how can we clearly distinguish between data mining and uh, uh, machine learning? Um, one simple answer is they are different course numbers. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there are clearly overlaps between them. Um, there are certain clear overlaps, but I think the big difference is, at least in my mind, and if you ask, for example, Jeff Phillips, he will give you a different answer. Um, in my mind, machine learning is the field where we talk about making predictions about unseen data, whereas data mining is about understanding data and discovering patterns from the data. So it's about understanding versus prediction. Uh, that's my mental model of this. But clearly the techniques in one apply to the other. Then we learn the maybe, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it depends on your assumptions um, that you make for those uh, for the pattern discovery. Uh, I'm thinking the simplest thing would be like a 3D type uh, analysis. Maybe your data. We don't have to go into the the details, but maybe, maybe. I saw another hand. Yes. Uh, would you consider artificial intelligence a specific subset of machine learning that has some properties, or is it more just a buzzword that gets thrown around in today's because people oh. don't understand the technical differences? <laughs> that hurts. Um, <laughs> I, I actually think artificial intelligence is a broader field. Machine learning is a tool that has very strong overlap with AI. And so let me give you some a little bit of history here. Um, before about the late late 80s, early 90s, definitely 70s and 80s till then, artificial intelligence was completely about writing rules that we can use to build programs, like ch playing chess and such things. It was about um, uh, building programs that can search through the game states for chess, as an example, um, for playing chess. Now, machine learning comes along and it says, Sure, but real life is noisy. Real life does not neatly fit into these sort of uh, symbolic buckets. So we need something to smooth things out. Real, real life does not reveal itself like chess does. For instance, the entire game state is visible. So you have to deal with uncertainty. You have to deal with noise. And the best tools for dealing with uncertainty and noise are probability and statistics. And that's one way in which... Uh, machine learning kind of grew out of this. Another way in which it grew out of this is uh, uh, a completely orthogonal perspective was humans seem to be good at learning and humans seem to have these sort of wires and neurons in their heads. Can I build programs that can 
mimic that and then build this capability. And that was a different sort of a uh, set intellectual piece. Artificial intelligence has other things in it. Artificial intelligence supplies the applications. Um, computer vision, for example, is not machine learning. Computer vision involves this more broader question of I need programs that can process visual input like humans, or even better, I don't know what that means. Natural language processing, which is in artificial intelligence, is not machine learning. It's about building programs that can handle language. It does not have to have machine learning. In fact, uh, until recently, the machine uh, until maybe 10, 15 years ago, machine learning was not even the de facto tool for building NLP. It just so happens that machine learning is a fantastic tool for all of these things because the data is noisy, the data is uh, uncertain, the data is huge, and we we just need the capabilities provided by machine learning. So that's my point of view. I think that machine learning is a collection of tools that just is the perfect set of tools for artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a collection of problems. Um, it involves building programs that can uh, uh, you know, uh, see and hear and uh, smell and such things. But machine learning also applies to other places. Machine learning applies to, for instance, uh, um, there was a, I'll give you one awesome example. There was this, at MIT in 2020, there was a, uh, a program that was used to sift through molecular structures to find one that can kill previously unkillable bacteria. That particular molecule, they found one. And uh, I don't know what happened. They synthesized it. It worked in the Petri dish. And after that, I got lost track. But they, they called it Halicin after HAL 9000. That's not, you can think of that as artificial intelligence because it, it in a loose sense, it is in some sense replicating the scientific process. So it is artificial intelligence. It is using machine learning. So machine learning is a tool. So that's the perspective that I have. I think artificial intelligence is a collection of problems that naturally lends itself to being, uh, or, or rather machine learning naturally lends itself to uh, being used in those collection of problems. Other questions? So can we say that machine learning is a means to maybe achieve AI? Uh, it's, 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 a, it's one of the best tools that we have today. I personally think it's not the only tool that we need. Um, even though I'm teaching machine learning, I think we need more than that. But uh, it's uh, at that point, we are getting into uh, personal opinions. Other questions and uh, maybe questions from people who don't sit in this row. I realize that because I'm standing here, I feel like I'm talking to this group. If I go far away, people on Zoom may not be able to hear me. That doesn't mean I'm not looking at you. Um, if you have any questions or comments or thoughts. Yes. I'm trying to understand the fit, the, the related field between part of the machine learning. Okay. And like, can I see it as a Venn diagram? Like, okay, this is machine learning, this is artificial intelligence, and then they can meet in the middle but not everything in artificial intelligence is used in machine learning, and not mm -hmm. everything machine learning is used in artificial intelligence. That's, uh, that's, that seems like a reasonable uh, worldview. Yeah. Um, there are things in AI that don't dire directly come into machine learning. For instance, search. Um, if you've taken AI, you probably uh, recognize that. Um, and then there's inference, which kind of connects to machine learning, but not directly. Um, and then there are all these other things like utility theory and such things which show up in AI, but not in ML. But you always use them. And there's an overlap. And the, it, you know, the, the community of people doing these things has such a strong overlap that it's hard to tell what's what. Uh, I, for example, publish in artificial intelligence venues. I publish in machine learning venues or NLP venues, more NLP than uh, the others. But I can't really say that, oh, today I'm a machine learning person. Or I can't. Right now, I am a machine learning person because I'm teaching the class. But uh, you know, they, there's such a strong overlap. What time does the class end? I keep, I can keep talking about this, but I want to make sure that uh, I, we have time, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, because I do want to leave time for the boring stuff, the logistics, and all those things that uh, uh, at the end of the semester I have to assign, uh, make you into a rank list. 
and I need to come up with a mechanism for that, and I need to tell you about. So let me get into this, uh, uh, you know, overview of the class. So, yeah. In the yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So wouldn't that say that, for example, the function of woman in mind is here? Um, it's not just in the function. Or is it another criteria, or is it more? Let me uh, rephrase your question because it's an interesting question. In the game that we played, in the Badger game, it seemed like the number of rules that can exist is infinite. And anytime anyone suggested a rule, I could just as well say, no, that's not the one. That's not the one that I was thinking of on uh, Monday. So the question is, how can we ever know that we are right? Right? I'm not going to answer that question. Instead, I will, uh, because that's kind of, that will require me to go through an entire semester's class. And luckily, we have an entire semester. Uh, but the, the, the short answer of that is, or the, the, the thing I want you to think about is, does it really matter that you got the exact same function? What if you and I have different functions in our head, but the differences only manifest in one out of a hundred million names? Is that okay? Are you willing to live with error? How much error is okay for your application? Chances are you cannot avoid error. And in fact, in the on the in the lecture on Thursday, I'm going to go to some length to prove to you mathematically that machine learning is impossible. Um, and then I'll try to back away from that, of course. Um, uh, but in some sense, the question is, does it matter that you get the exact same function or does it is it okay if you get it right almost always? So let's talk about what we will do for the rest of the semester. The main question is what's learning? And uh, in, in some sense, this is the framing question for the entire semester. What is learning? And we'll try to answer this question in different formal ways. Uh, and different formal answers to the question will give us, will naturally lead to different kinds of learning algorithms. And actually, it won't give us new learning algorithms. It will give us new recipes for designing new learning algorithms. Different ways to answer this question. And uh, we'll see different kinds of models, different learning protocols, learning algorithms. Uh, we'll look at computational learning theory, and we'll throw mostly homeworks and such things. You will be looking at what it means to represent data. Um, we'll see different kinds of models. And I put models in quotes because that word has so many meanings. Um, so in the context of this class, what I mean, at least in the context of this slide, what I mean is we look at uh, different kinds of functions, mathematical functions, that a program can learn. These kinds of... Uh, these functions could be decision trees, which will be the first thing that we look at. These functions could be linear classifiers or linear regressors. These functions could be more complicated functions like uh, neural networks or kernels. We'll most likely never get to kernels, but that's just a buzzword. Um, we'll look at uh, ensembles of functions where we have a committee of classifiers or a committee of uh, functions that are all kind of voting on the right answer. All of these are mathematically uh, just functions that uh, that the learner loves. And we look at uh, many of these things, and you'll be implementing many of these things. We look at different kinds of, actually, we not look at different learning protocols. There are different learning protocols. Uh, I'll quickly go through this list and then tell you that uh, we'll not do it. Uh, there's something called supervised learning. In supervised learning, the teacher supplies a collection of examples, like that badges data that I showed. You have like six names and you know I supply a collection of examples and then the learner has to figure out what the teacher's hidden function is. Um, in other words, the learner has to label new examples. Figuring out the hidden function is as good as labeling new examples. So there's supervision in the form of labeled examples. The complete opposite is unlabeled examples un or unsupervised learning where really there's no teacher. The learner just gets some uh, data and has to discover functions. And this falls more in the data mining uh, world. So imagine in the badges game, I tell you that every name has a label, plus or minus. 
Here's a collection of names. I'm not going to show you even a single label. Now figure out the function. Unsupervised learning is way harder because you know you're you're not you don't have any signal. And you need to discover the pattern in the data. And maybe you discover a different pattern than what I had in mind. A mix between these two is semi-supervised learning where the learner has access to some labeled examples of the kinds that I showed, showed you and a whole collection of unlabeled examples that tell you these are the kinds of things that you'll be tested on and the learner has to figure out the right one. Yes. How, how would you learn with unlabeled examples? You have to make assumptions. Anytime you, the dirty trick in a lot of these things is when you don't have something, you make assumptions about that thing. So you have to make assumptions about the nature of the data. Um, you could, there are different kinds of assumptions. For instance, uh, in the names thing, I can't think of a single assumption that would be justifiable. But uh, imagine that uh, with, uh, say, uh, something like, say, um, uh, you, you, you get a collection of DNA data. And you somehow convert all of them into uh, to, uh, you know some signals, uh, some uh, a collection of uh, numbers. So every sample becomes like a, a, a list of ten numbers. And now you believe that this list of ten numbers is redundant, and so you can compress it somehow, and you remove the noise. So you are making some assumption. Mm -hmm. uh, it allows you to describe data more than make predictions. Uh, now, a particularly cool protocol for learning, but notice that in all of these, I call this a learning protocol because this is a way in which the learning algorithm interacts with the true concept, the true concept being the hidden function. In supervised case, the learning algorithm is taught the true concept by presenting, by the teacher presenting labeled examples. In unsupervised learning, the true concept is not really presented, the learning algorithm has to do some figuring out. Active learning is super interesting. Active learning involves the teacher and the learner engaging in a conversation. The learner sees some examples, guesses something, and then asks the teacher, hey, if the name had been this, what might the label have been? And then the teacher gives a label, and the learner kind of improves. Active learning, both for humans and for machines, tends to be super efficient, which is why you should always ask questions in class. Uh, come to office hours. Exactly. Active learning is also kind of hard to um, uh, do experiments with because it requires us to uh, involve a person in the loop all the time. Um, another protocol for learning, which is actually really neat, is called reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, how many people have seen reinforcement learning? Far more than I'm used to. Uh, but reinforcement learning is really neat. Reinforcement learning has a program and age sometimes in the reinforcement learning world it's called an agent the agent interacts with the world and accumulates rewards by doing things by doing actions and the goal of learning is to do more do actions that give it more rewards and do actions that uh, don't give it penalties and in the process it learns something about them so reinforcement learning allows us to build programs that can interact with the world this may seem all of this may seem very very complicated um, for better or worse, I think we'll only look at supervised learning in this class simply because that itself is going to keep us busy for a good part of the semester. How many people have seen supervised learning? Some subset of you. Good. Okay. I mean, even if you've not, that's okay because uh, that's what we'll, uh, at the end of the semester, hopefully, you'll be experts on it. In this context, we'll be looking at different learning algorithms. Uh, there are a few different learning algorithms can take different shapes. One way to categorize these things is there are some algorithms called online algorithms. Online algorithms uh, access data only one at a time. So the learner can access one example with a label and then update itself. Then it tosses out that example, never to see it again. And then the next example comes along. This works nicely in the case of in a streaming setting where your data set is so large, you don't have enough memory to fit it in the, uh, fit all the data, so you kind of go through one at a time. In contrast, you have something called a batch algorithm. The batch algorithm, the learner loads the entire data to memory, does whatever it wants with it, and then spits out the function, the hidden row. 
perhaps the most famous online algorithm is something called the perceptron. It's also one of the oldest learning algorithms that exist. Um, and surprisingly, it's still good. Uh, we'll be talking about perceptron in some detail. Um, and in the batch, today the dominant uh, uh, way to do machine learning is mostly batch algorithms, and most of the algorithms that you may have heard about fall into that bucket. Um, we'll be looking at support vector machines, logistic regression, neural networks, uh, decision trees, nearest neighbors, uh, ensembles, uh, if time permits, naive base. All of these are batch algorithms, and the idea is all of these algorithms take the entire data into memory, process it, do whatever it wants, whatever it, uh, um, whatever they want with the data, and then spit out uh, a final uh, decision rule that it believes was used to label the data. So it's not like there's a the learner is uh, constrained to working only with one or a small set of examples at a time. In the unsupervised, semi-supervised world, there are uh, really cool uh, generators for algorithms. We are not going to talk about that and that every every year I talk about these last things, it gives me a little bit of pain because expectation maximization is such a cool idea. If you have time, learn it. Um, we won't be talking about it. K-means is a special case of the EM, expectation maximization, and you may have seen K-means clustering uh, in other contexts. So hopefully, not hopefully, but maybe some of you have used some of these uh, names uh, as black boxes. And the, one of the goals of this class is uh, you know what you will know at the end of the semester what's happening inside these things. And the way I want to guarantee that you know what's happening inside these things is that you'll implement all of them from scratch using no libraries. Um, we'll talk about that stuff, uh, what you will be doing in a bit. Um, one of the most important and somewhat understudied or underappreciated things in machine learning is the importance of representing data for a certain task. Uh, if you choose the right set of features, learning is actually trivial, it's super easy. So how do you know what the right way to represent data is? Turns out it's a very difficult question to answer. And uh, we'll be looking at a few different ways to, uh, I mean, rather than uh, presenting any theory about it or anything like that, um, uh, we'll be discussing it along the way in, uh, in the context of the various algorithms we encounter. And towards the end of the semester, in the last third of the semester, I'm just going to throw up my hands and say, I don't know how to represent data. Let me just make that a learning problem and have another learning uh, learner get me the right representation. And if you go along that path, what you get are deep neural networks. The sort of a common theme that ties everything together for this class is the theory of machine learning. This will come at the in the middle of the semester. Uh, the question is, what does it mean to learn? And there are different ways of answering this question. And different ways of answering this question gives you different definitions of whether something is learnable or not. There's online learning where I said uh, the learner encounters um, examples one at a time, and then it makes mistakes as it goes along, but every time it makes a mistake, maybe it corrects itself. And then the, the goal is over the lifetime of the program, we want the program to make as few mistakes as possible. Or maybe over the lifetime of the program, eventually the program is going to be perfect and stop making mistakes. If I can guarantee that, I have guaranteed that the program is learned. So we'll see such algorithms later. Another uh, really cool theory for uh, uh, machine learning is this wonderfully named, probably approximately correct learning, uh, where the idea is after seeing some set of examples, the learner will produce a function that has that's not perfect, but has low error, but that even that is only with high probability. Maybe sometimes it will just fail, but with high probability, you'll get a function that is really good. And the question is, when will that happen? Well, the theory tells you that in certain situations, it, uh, it can. Another theoretical way to think about learning is the Bayesian perspective, where we start thinking about probability distributions over these rules that we want to learn. Probability distributions over functions. Um, and uh, rather than saying, this is the function that produced the, the data, you can ask, what's the distribution over functions? 
And uh, let me try to characterize that distribution. That way to go about it gives us Bayesian learning. Uh, we'll roughly spend maybe a few weeks on online learning, a few weeks on probably, probably approximately kind of learning, a few weeks on Bayesian learning. And in each case, we will be looking at a bunch of algorithms that come into that family. So in online learning, we'll look at Perceptron. In PAC, we'll look at support vector machines and boosting and ensembles. Uh, in Bayesian learning, we'll look at uh, logistic regression. Uh, I really hope we also get chance, a chance to look at naive base. And then at the end of this, I'll say, you know, we have these three different theoretical ways to look at learning. The, the thing about any theory is theory makes assumptions about nature. Assumptions that may not always be true. And so we'll toss all the theory aside and then ask, what happens if we don't make those assumptions and just go with the data? And that takes us to things like neural networks, which are actually the uh, success stories today. This course is not about any one specific machine learning tool like PyTorch or TensorFlow or such things. It's not about any one learning paradigm like uh, using these neural networks. It's about the underlying concepts of what it means to learn and the, the algorithmic ideas that make that, the, the, that, that allow learning to happen or not. That's the goal of this class. As a side effect, you'll end up encountering a whole bunch of algorithms. As a side effect, you'll in, end up implementing a whole bunch of algorithms. As a side effect, you'll probably end up with uh, something like the beginning of a machine learning library of your own. But that's not the focus of the class. That's just the tool that we'll use to uh, make sure that you get those two things. So what you learn is a broad theoretical and practical understanding of uh, machine learning paradigms and machine learning algorithms. You will, through homeworks, gain the ability to implement learning algorithms from scratch. And uh, hopefully, along the way, you'll be able to understand what kinds of situations can machine learning be used and what are the kinds of design choices that you'll make when you employ machine learning. Any questions about any of these things? There is stunned silence. I'm going to go right ahead. Yes. You have a question? Previous slide. Uh, one that uh, you said about supervising, that's supervised, and there is not as well. So, uh, um, if I'm not wrong, you said that uh, in semi supervised learning, we have some uh, unlabeled data. Yes. But also in supervised learning, we use uh, we used to keep aside a portion of data as validation test. Uh, You're using words that we've not seen, but carry on. Yes. Uh, so how does it how does it do different things? Uh, in supervised learning, you're not okay. So the short answer is in unsupervised learning, you're allowed to look at the validation and test data and improve the model based on that. In any situation, you are not you should we'll we'll talk about the experimental uh, setup a little later. I mean, as we go along, but Ooh. you're not allowed to look at the validation and the test data. Whereas in unsupervised learning, you look at the unlabeled data because it's not set aside for evaluation. It's not set aside for evaluation. It's set aside. It is used for model improvement. Anytime you think about using the test data for making your model better, it's as if you look at the exam questions. Sure, you'll get 100 on the exam, but that doesn't mean that you understand the concept, right? So that's the same, uh, same philosophy. In unsupervised learning, you get access to examples that are not necessarily the ones that you'll be tested on. And uh, you're not allowed to look at the test set anyway in any of these situations. So the only thing that I want to talk about next is we talked about what you will learn. I'm going to talk about how you learn, which uh, is a much better way of thinking about uh, the very boring question of course logistics. So let's talk about course logistics, information, very basic stuff. Uh, all the technical materials for the class will be on the class website. There's a link to this on Canvas. Um, we'll be using Canvas as uh, the primary discussion forum. You should all have access to Canvas now, right? Um, if you haven't uh, checked it out, make sure that you do. Um, we'll be using Canvas as our primary discussion uh, uh, forum. 
Uh, this class is, of course, in person. Um, but I'm also streaming the class on Zoom for people who can't make it for whatever reason. And uh, uh, eventually, after every lecture, at some point, I will upload the lecture on YouTube. There will be some playlist so that uh, in case you find that useful. Um, we'll be using Canvas for any announcements. I will not be using email for that. Uh, and Canvas is also the place for uh, managing any submissions and grades and such things. Okay, so the technical material alone will be on the course website. Everything else is on Canvas. Um, in terms of the who and the where. The class is right here, right now. So congratulations, you made it. Uh, I am the instructor. Congratulations to me, I made it. Um, I'll be, uh, I have office hours after class every Tuesday um, uh, at 2 p.m. You'll be in my office. Uh, we can walk together to my office if you want. And uh, there are five teaching assistants in the class who are strategically distributed across the room. Can you stand up? There are at least three of them uh, in class right now. Oh, not strategically, you're all bunched together. Uh, so we have uh, Joe, Dichav, and Guru. And uh, there are two more. Uh, Sashank is uh, uh, will be here, uh, I think, next week or something like that. And Yuan is primarily going to be uh, offering remote help. OK? Um, and uh, we are still figuring out things like PM meetings and such things. And uh, we'll, uh, when that gets uh, finalized, there'll be an announcement on campus. I strongly encourage class participation. Um, uh, participating in class helps understand, uh, your understanding, but also when you ask questions in class, I guarantee if you have a question, another 30 people have the same question, and by asking the question, you are helping your friends also. So, or people who are not your friends. Um, this is uh, some of the complex material that we we'll cover in the class can get complex. And so, you know. It helps to ask questions. It helps to participate. Um, let's make this a conversation. Only be the progress. Um, you can ask. You can participate in classes anyway. In, in person, of course, you know, raise your hand, and uh, uh, we'll. I'll try to answer the question. Sometimes, if I'm too focused on my slides and I don't see you, you can just shout out, uh, or at least point to the person who has a question. If you are participating, if you are on Zoom, you can use chat, and either me or my TAs will uh, get to the question. Uh, and you know, if you have any other ideas, uh, feel free to offer suggestions. So you can send me a message. Speaking of sending messages, um, uh, let's use Canvas as the primary uh, medium for communication. If you have any questions that you think are that that deserve a discussion. Um, use the discussion board, and I expect this will be the place that will be the most active thing. Um, if you have any uh, uh, private questions that you want to reach out to me or the TAs, I encourage you use uh, the Canvas messages. As a last resort, use email. Um, email turnaround is going to be very slow. If you ever send an email, prefix a class number in the subject line, but with the knowledge that email turnaround is going to be slow. I strongly encourage use Canvas, uh, the Canvas messages. And anytime you send a message on Canvas, uh, send a message to all, me and all the TAs so that at least one of us gets to it first. Unless, of course, it's confidential. If you feel like you need to talk to me in private, uh, uh, send me alone the message. Uh, look for announcements. We'll be using Canvas for announcements. Anything that any messages that we need to send to you will be through Canvas announcements, your messages as well. So, how will you, how will learning proceed? Uh, I expect that in this class, you have encountered uh, basic probability and statistics before. So when I say things like uh, uh, mean, I hope that means something. Um, uh, I expect that you have encountered some amount of linear algebra. So when I say things like vector, you know what that means, or a matrix. Um, I hope that you have the ability to implement algorithms that we'll encounter in class. So I'm not going to talk about any code in the lectures. I'll just be describing algorithms at a high level. And you should be able to, you should have enough of a CS background that you translate, you're able to translate that into a program. Yes. 
Uh, does it not say that on the slide? It will, but uh, I can, usually I have a uh, I allow people to use whatever language they want, uh, but increasingly I'm favoring Python mm -hmm. uh, for the simple reason that uh, that's the language in which we'll be able to help the best. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you use uh, a language that I can't compile, um, I don't know what to do. Uh, don't use that. Uh, I hate it. Uh, for no other reason other than that. Uh, no, I mean, actually, you can use whatever language you want, but I expect almost all of you will use Python for the for two reasons. One, that's the language in which we can offer the help. Uh, we can offer help the best. And the second one is uh, most machine learning um, practitioners today use Python. So if you're going to use these things and use the concepts you learn in the class and want to build up to say internships and uh, on in your uh, research or in your uh, in, in a job or something like that, but look, being comfortable with Python and thinking through Python using uh, uh, thinking through these ideas in in the context of Python is going to be helpful. Uh, there's no textbook for the class. The class is self-contained. I have a list of recommended or uh, suggested readings on the uh, resources page. Um, you know, uh, you're not, you don't have to buy any of that stuff. The class is, uh, the material is going to be available online. And for every lecture, I'll also post uh, uh, links to relevant material that you may want to read if you want to learn more about that topic. Um, uh, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just curious. Do you have a recommendation for this requirement? Yes, uh, uh, it's not a recommendation as much as a requirement. Uh, any code that you run, any code that you submit has to work on the CAD machine. Uh, in the, do people know the CAD lab? Yeah, so if you don't know the CAD lab, I think uh, if you search for CAD, Utah, you'll get like a whole tutorial. You'll get more text than you care about. Uh, but any code that you uh, submit has to run on the CAD machine without us having to install things like uh, the environment. So use the existing uh, environment. Okay, so let's, yes. Is there like a, a tutorial on Canvas or how to go about to do that? Yeah, uh, there's a link to that also on the resources page. Um, and uh, if there isn't, uh, post a message on the discussion board and we'll uh, get that going. So in terms of what you'll be doing through the semester, uh, there'll be a bunch of assignments. Uh, there'll be like five or six or seven assignments in all, which will account for the bulk of the grade. And this will be spread across the semester. Um, There'll be two exams, um, a midterm and a final, which each account for 10%. And uh, at the end of the semester, you'll be doing, uh, start somewhere in the middle of the semester, you'll start working on a project that will kind of wrap up at the end of the semester, and that will be, uh, that will account for 15% uh, of the grade. And I'll tell you details about the project as we go along. It's a little too early to talk about that now. Okay. Uh, speaking of homeworks, like I said, there are six to seven homeworks, and uh, uh, roughly one every two weeks. If you kind of divide the number of weeks we have by six or seven, you'll get that. And uh, grad students in the class, the, I think there are, this class has about 196 or something grad students and the rest are undergrads. So grad students have to do a little bit more work because, uh, I don't know, because you're a grad student. Um, and not all homework, but many homeworks will involve a programming component. Um, you should, like I said, you, your code should run on the CAD machines and uh, we strongly prefer Python. If you really, 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 really want to use a different language, come talk to me and uh, I'll try to talk you out of it. Um, and we will accept only digital submissions because of course I don't want to read your handwriting. Um, and there's a late policy for any submission, all submissions, including the, the homework, the project, not the exams. The homework from the project, the late policy is, um, if you submit, you're, you you can get one day extra for any homework, any submission you have. But if you if you use that late day, you give up ten percent of your points. So in exchange for ten percent of your points, you get one percent one one day extra. In person, in exchange for hundred percent of your points, you get any number of days you want. So for, what that means is, uh, if you submit by the deadline, and let's say you score ninety points on something, if you submit within the next twenty four hours. You lose ten percent, so you you lose nine points. After that, you lose everything. Um, 
this is almost definitely going to be a rigid policy unless there are like ridiculously exceptional situations typically involving health. Okay. And if at all possible, um, make the deadline because uh, then, you know, there are no, uh, you get enough. We've tried to set it up so that you have enough time to um, uh, get to the homework. And I'll, I'll keep reminding you about the homeworks in every lecture to the point where it gets annoying so that you start early. Um, the project, the goal is to show what we've learned. Uh, it, it's going to be something that I call a competitive project. It's not really competitive, but it's a nice name. Uh, you'll work individually on a data set that I provide and sub apply different learning algorithms to that data set and submit, make submissions on Kaggle. And there will be several milestones where you will be, uh, um, that, that we'll, we'll get to later. Um, I, maybe I got this date wrong, but, uh, there's a, there's a milestone on uh, project information, which just says, create an account on Kaggle and tell me your account name. Um, it's an important milestone because if you were to get that wrong, I will not be able to get grade the rest of your project. Okay, uh, let's talk about class policies. Um, the short version of the policy is uh, go over the syllabus on the website. I know from personal experience and from you know having seen students that nobody reads the syllabus. The syllabus is a boring document to make and to read. Uh, if you think it's boring to read, trust me, it's boring to make, uh, but it's worth reading it because it talks about various things that uh, are uh, relevant to you. I'm going to just give you the highlights of the policies. This class operates under the School of Computing Policies, um, and that is just a pointer to a whole bunch of other policies that you can read. Uh, in particular, one thing that I want to stress on is uh, the policy on collaboration and cheating. I think collaboration is helpful. I think collaboration helps. Talking to people helps you understand the material better. But when any time that you submit anything, it should be created by you. It should be uh, like any code that you submit should be written by you. Any text that you write should be written by you. The alternative is cheating. So uh, the School of Computing has a uh, somewhat detailed policy on uh, misconduct. There's a link on the website. Uh, you know, anytime you use any external sources to understand something or uh, uh, external could be, for example, your friends or something online, acknowledge it. Uh, don't just take someone else's code and submit it. Write your own code. Otherwise, what's the point? I mean, this whole class is about learning. And I can tell you that one guaranteed way of not learning is not doing the work. Uh, your submission, which could be homeworks, it could be text that you write, it could be code, any mathematical proofs that you, implement, that you come up with should be your own. And there's nothing that is a group submission. That said, though, I have been told by many students in the past that forming study groups has been very, very helpful for this class. So I encourage you to form study groups, meet, uh, discuss, and that thing. But when it comes time to doing, do it on your own. Uh, if you, uh, I, I really want to kind of make this class uh, accessible. So if you need any assistance, get in touch sooner rather than later. Um, in particular, oh, there are many questions on. Um, there's a question. Can I elaborate on the CS skills? I'm not sure uh, what that meant. What I meant was uh, you should be able to uh, see an algorithm that is described as a high level and implement it in Python. Use make the right design choices, right data structures, and all that. And there's another question. Will there be a tutorial on CAD machine usage? And will uh, we have a resource on the resources uh, link on the resources page, and CAD has its own uh, uh, documentation on how to go about that. So, anytime, uh, so uh, accessibility, uh, if you have any accessibility requests, I encourage you to start processing that with the, uh, the, the CDS or CDA uh, sooner rather than later. This is the time of the year when they start getting a whole bunch of requests and they get backed up. Start sooner rather than later because otherwise, uh, uh, next thing you know, you'll have a homework and things will suddenly uh, get crowded. Uh, there are a bunch of other policies. Uh, there's like, a, a, you know, if you need any help with safety, there's a pointer there. Uh, of course, uh, I, I, this should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway that, of course, can't be any 
the harassment of any kind in the class. And uh, I recognize that, you know, this class, I've been told that this class can be a lot of work. This class can involve uh, a pretty heavy workload. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying that to scare you off so that my TS have a easier time to grade. Uh, it's a fact. Um, and the thing is, when workload gets high, students tend to stress out a bit. So it's easy to say, easy for me to say, don't stress about it. It's just a class, but that makes no sense. So if you ever feel like you need any sort of a wellness check or anything, the university does provide resources, and you know it's a uh, it's a fantastic resource. Um, I, no no reason not to take care to take advantage of it. This class has 179 students when I checked this morning. I don't know if there are 179 people here, but at least 179 people registered. And one thing that bothers me a lot is that I'm never going to know all of you, and that's really annoying. Um, so I do have a survey on Canvas. It's completely optional, um, just as a mechanism for me to understand what you want, who you are and what you want. Feel free to fill up as much of it as you can, if you want to. Uh, that way, you know, if you have any specific uh, uh, needs or any specific uh, 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 topics that you want me to cover or any specific expertise that you can offer or any uh, kind of uh, interesting domains that you, perspectives that you bring, I can tailor the lectures. I'll try. There are 180 people, so I can't tailor it to everyone, but at least I can occasionally throw in examples from, I don't know, material science, for instance. That's all I have for today, except, you know, it's the end of the first lecture, and I think it's important that I make sure that uh, I give you a homework. Hi. Uh, there is a homework that's available on Canvas right now. Um, it's homework zero. Homework zero is uh, just a small 20 question uh, uh, quiz on Canvas that allows you to refresh your memories about the prerequisites. You get two attempts at it, uh, and we, I'll, I'll keep the highest score. Uh, it's supposed to be easy. The prerequisite homework is supposed to be easy because this is stuff that you've already seen before. So uh, you get a week for it. Please get to it as soon as you can. And finally, this class is oversubscribed. There are some of you who do not are not yet registered. If you're not registered, nothing has changed yet. Um, I've sent you an email and. Uh, We'll keep, uh, we'll, you know, if space opens up, I'll let you in. Great, thank you so much. I'll see you.